Galatians chapter 3. Let's do verse by verse again. Amen. Amen. All right. I always enjoy verse by verse Bible studies. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because I like to glean through the word yeah. and then let the Lord speak to me. That's what I like. So as my, I enjoy teaching dispensationalism. That's probably where I'm most famous for. And then conspiracy theories. I like those too. And then I also enjoy teaching about defending the King James Bible and then beating up scholars. And then you'll see once in a while your pastor in a little bad mood, you know, kicking scholars. So I enjoy these things, but the thing that I enjoy the most is just gleaning through the word, yeah. gleaning through the word. That's always the best thing to do. And that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Okay, Galatians chapter 3. Now we're going to cover some very interesting things on dispensationalism. So I would like to have your undivided attention on this, okay? All right, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So God gave the promises to Abraham and his seed. But you'll notice that this promises is not going to be referring to Jews. This is not talking about a physical line of Jews. This is something else. He saith not, and to seeds as of many. So God's not saying that there are many different seeds. There's only one seed. But as of one, okay, what is this seed? And to thy seed, which is, notice, Christ. So you'll notice right here that according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, uh, I just forgot the verse, 16. I have bad memory lately. So Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, what we discover right here is that there is only one seed coming out of Abraham. So within this one seed, it is spiritual. It's not physical. Because notice it says, which is who? Christ. So that is very important. So Paul, he's trying to point out to the Jews right here that it's not concerning your physical line that makes a difference. What makes a difference concerning salvation is the spiritual line, which is Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or how many Christian churches might say, that we practically worship the Jews. And then John Hagee, he thinks that a Jew is automatically saved just for being a Jew, physically. No, it doesn't matter about your physical line. Yeah. What matters is your spiritual line. That is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter as long as you have the spiritual seed. So notice the seed is defined as Jesus Christ. So we know that this has to be referring to a spiritual seed right here. Now the thing is this is that notice that the promises were made to Abraham's spiritual line, his seed. So then the problem is this. There are two things. Two things is, how are you going to convince a Jew that with his Old Testament? Because remember, there was no New Testament that time. And Paul, he's trying to argue from Scripture, from Old Testament with the Jews. So how do you honestly convince a Jew about this? Well, how you can convince him is look at Genesis. Look at the book of Genesis chapter 17. Look at the book of Genesis, and then we'll look at chapter 17, please. Chapter 17. We'll look at Genesis chapter 17. Now, what you're going to find out right here is that concerning about this seed, we know for a fact this is not referring to solely Israel. So that's what they might argue right here. It's the physical line that matters, Israel. That's what they'll be arguing right here. But what you're going to find out right here is that, no, it has nothing to do with solely Israel. This is not the case right here. Why is that? It's going to consist of different nations. Now, Israel is a nation. But you've got to realize this. Notice that the Bible says it's nations. Hmm. There's something going on right here then. Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, uh, verse 4, excuse me. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of one nation? No, many nations. Look at verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. Why is he called Abraham? See, Abraham, see, this name, oh, we're of Abraham, we're of Abraham. No, Abraham would not even exist. Because why? But thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. So 
So this is a very strong argument against a Jew. If you want to convince a Jew or you're witnessing to a Jew through the Old Testament, who's taking pride in being of Abraham's seed, then what you can argue right here is this. Then you got to realize that Abraham should not even exist. You don't even exist. Why? Because his name means father of many nations. Now, remember, go back to Galatians 3.16. Remember that verse? It's not seeds, plural, right? So obviously then, if God's going to say nations, and this is only one seed, one seed, then this doesn't make any sense unless it's spiritual. So that's how you can convince a Jew that this has to be a spiritual seed. How you can convince a Jew is that this is a spiritual seed is well, then how are we going to put one seed here and it says nations? Because look at every, I'm not talking about New Testament. Look at every Old Testament passage that God gave to Abraham. You'll always see seed singular, seed singular, seed singular. But God says that many nations and kings and different nationalities will come out. So this makes sense that this has to be a spiritual seed right here. But here's another thing. You can go back to Genesis 3. So go to Genesis 3. Jews will admit that there is a Messiah coming out one day. They do believe in that. Their religion teaches that. So then you can argue that the seed is referring to the Messiah. It's referring to Christ, his seed. Look at Genesis chapter 3. And then we will read verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and, and what? Her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So notice right here that there is a promised seed that should smite the devil. And the Jews will admit that there will be a Messiah who will smite the devil's government one day. So that's your seed right there. That makes sense. It's referring to that Messiah, Jesus Christ. So use the combination. But what's even stronger is this. What, what builds up the evidence is that Christ is a picture of Isaac. So we're going to look at the book of Genesis. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And then once you have Genesis 22, I want you to go to the book of John. Let's see what Jesus said. Jesus himself even admitted that. Look at John. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 22. And then we're also going to turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Genesis chapter 22. And then we'll also look at John chapter 8. Now what's very interesting is that when we look at John chapter 8, Jesus is telling the Jews, you're not of Abraham's seed. You're not of Abraham's seed. Why did Jesus say that? Because he's focusing on his spiritual seed. He's not focusing their physical line. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 22. Notice how Isaac is a picture of Christ. And Abraham saw Christ's day. He saw the Messiah seed through Isaac. Because look at Genesis chapter 22. And then notice what the King James Bible says. That's why in other modern Bibles it's going to be a mistake. Verse 7. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Look at verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will what? Provide himself a lamb. So God's providing himself as the lamb who will take away the sins of the world. But you look at other modern Bibles, they'll get rid of that. They'll get rid of God will provide himself a lamb. It will show God will provide a lamb for himself or something like that. In other words, God himself is going to find some kind of lamb out there. That's what modern Bibles will show. By the way, the so-called Korean King James Bible, it's a mess, the Korean King James Bible issue. There are like, uh, last time I counted, probably six or something like that. It's a mess. But the more famous one is uh, the right one, which is by Song Li, and then the second one by Dong Su Chong. So Dong Su Jung's King James Bible has been popular among the fundamentalists. But in my doctorate paper, when I covered him, he even messed up that verse too. So he 
copycatted the modern Bible, said God will provide a lamb later on for himself. Not God providing himself as the lamb. Yeah. He'll take away the sins of the world. So that so any of you fundamentalists out there who have a Korean King James Bible, if it's by Tong Su Jung, you gotta reject that. That is a that is not a King James Bible. That's a false modern Bible. But anyway, back to the facts right here. You'll notice how modern Bibles don't like this. Why? Because here's the thing. If you don't think that verse is important, then how are you going to reconcile John 8? Go, so go to John chapter 8. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad to see it. So my question to you is this. How can Abraham see that if it's not Genesis 22? That verse. That is the only verse in your Bible where you can point out Abraham saw Christ's day, that one day Christ will become the lamb who will take away the sins of the world. God will provide himself as the lamb who will take away the sins of the world. That's the only verse. Hmm. Look at John chapter 8. That's why that verse is important. So you can point that out to the modern Bibles. Look at verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see whose day? My day. That's what Christ claimed. So Abraham, he did see Christ. The seed, excuse me. He saw Christ's day. Abraham saw my day. Let's keep reading right here. And he saw it and was glad. So notice right here that Abraham did see Christ as the seed. Now the thing is this though. Obviously, Abraham did not know 100% about Jesus Christ dying, buried, and resurrected. Not even the Old Testament prophets knew that. Isaiah chapter 53 was a prophecy of Christ's death, but Isaiah didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, the psalmist David talked about, they pierced my hands and my feet. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken thee? Why hast thou forsaken me? Prophesied about Christ's day, death, but David didn't know that. Why? Because, we're not going to turn to this verse because I quoted it many times. What's so important as a dispensationalist is to get 1 Peter chapter 1 down. 1 Peter chapter 1 told you, that the Old Testament prophets preached and prophesied and knew about this salvation by grace, but it wasn't revealed to them, it was revealed to us Christians. So that's why it makes sense that Abraham, he may not know this, we admit that to the Jew, but the thing is this, they did see glimpses of this, otherwise how would they prophesy that? How, why would God use that as a prophecy? And what, by the way, why did Abraham say that? God will provide himself a lamb. Why did he say that? Let's return to Galatians again. Galatians. So we see right here that Christ is the type of Isaac. That's the reason why. <clears throat> That's why we see that this seed, yeah, Isaac may come out of there, but the spiritually behind it, it is referring to Jesus Christ. Because if you don't believe it, then you're going to have a lot of problems with uh, how are you going to reconcile nations from one seed. It does not make sense in the Old Testament. By the way, there are too many verses in Old Testament alone about the Messiah who will come from the seed. Jews cannot deny that. They cannot deny that. Abraham also said God will provide himself a lamb. What did he mean by that? Okay, let's look at Galatians chapter 3. Now, we got a problem here now. This verse is a favorite text used by cultic pastors who hate dispensationalism. So cultic pastors, because they see this and they're anti-Semitic, what they like to do is, oh, that's right, Jews are evil. So yeah, it's not about their line, their seed. It's about us, the Christians, the Christians. So that's why they believe that they themselves, who are Christians, will replace the nation of Israel. That is totally bogus. So what you got to understand right here is that when we look at this verse, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, look at the line right here, which is who? Christ. Also, let's read back through our, our previous verses that we read. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the who? Not Jews, right? It's Gentiles. Yeah. Now, come on. Use your head. Do you honestly believe Abraham, when he gave birth to Isaac and to his children, they are called Gentiles? No, they are Jews, okay? Yeah. So this is so obvious. This is the blindness which God deliberately blinded them on. Now, I circled it for you so it's a no-brainer. 
Are we talking about a physical, literal seed here or a spiritual? Spiritual. So here's the point right here. Is Paul talking about physical seed here or spiritual? Spiritual. Just because he's talking about a spiritual seed does not mean there is no physical seed. If you think there is no physical seed, then you got to realize this. Then why is there even a Jew? Why is there even Isaac born? That does not make sense because Paul said that on the Gentiles right here. So he's focusing on a spiritual aspect. That's obvious. That is so obvious. Look, even an atheist believes this, okay? Even an atheist will agree. They don't know, they don't believe in Abraham too much, but they do believe some guy out there gave birth to Jews. So there is a physical seed. Everyone, everyone believes in this. Everyone believes that the Jews come out from Abraham. That is proven by history, etymology, and not even not only that, even your Bible. The Bible talks about Jews, Hebrews, Israelites from Abraham. So that is that is a plain fact. So that doesn't erase this, obviously. That does not erase this. The simple answer, it's more simple than you think. Paul was only focusing on a spiritual seed here. He was not focusing about the physical seed right here. Here's another thing right here. Another thing you got to realize is that this is only one covenant they're looking at that God made with Abraham. But you know what God did? God made two covenants with Abraham. So let me use blue right here. That way it can all be kind of sane right here. God made one covenant with Abraham. We saw that, right? That is Genesis. And then we saw it at chapter 17. And then we also saw it at chapter, uh, well, we didn't turn over there, but there's another Genesis 22. That's right. Genesis 22. That's when he offered up Isaac. What you're going to find right here, though, is that God, he made another covenant with Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, and then some parts of chapter 17 as well. God made a covenant with Abraham concerning the spiritual seed, and that is only one covenant, that is only one seed, that is a spiritual seed, spiritual covenant. But that does not erase that God made another covenant with Abraham concerning a physical seed. So you got to realize this. Let me explain with an example. Let's say that I made a promise, and I only made a promise to my brother, and it's one promise, and it's only him, my brother. And I promised him that I, uh, I never promised anything to him in, in all my life. So this is just hypothetical. Let's say that I promised that I'll give him $50, okay? I made a promise that I'll give you $50, and because he's backslidden, he's not going to watch this video, so he doesn't know, okay? So I can get away with it. So, so, I, so I made a promise. Do, do I include any other person, or it's just one person that I made that promise to? My brother, right? But I make a second promise to my dad, okay? I make him a promise that um, I will take him out to eat, okay? So I made another promise to my dad, but it's only that promise to my dad, and is there anyone else in there, or is it just my dad? My dad. Now, here's the funny thing about these two sides right here. Wouldn't it be funny that my dad said, no, you made a promise. You did. It's recorded. You actually made a promise. You'd give $50. And I said, yeah, it is one promise that I made to one brother, but it's to my brother right here. It's not to you. And wouldn't it be funny my brother said, you promised you'd take me out to eat because you actually said it right there. I said, yeah, but it's not to you. I made one promise to my dad, and it was just for him. That's the same thing. God made a covenant, a promise to Jews, and it's one promise, and it's only to them. Christians don't claim that. Right here, God made one promise to the Christians, no other seed, nobody else is included. It's just for Christians. You know what the problem with Jews and Christians are? They're like stealing from each other. They're mingling all of it together. Like saying, no, you made that promise right here. You made that promise right there. Hey, man, you got to fight. You got to use some common sense. Rightly dividing. It's just common sense that you got to rightly divide the promise to one person. So you'll hear these cultic pastors saying, it says, it's not to seeds many. Galatians 3.16. Seed, seed, seed. It's one seed, one seed, one seed. So you can't have Jews and Christians. It's just one seed, one seed. 
Well, hey, you dummy, you got to realize this. Do you think, now let's use your head, use your head. Do you think God only made one covenant in the entire Bible? One promise in the entire Bible. By the way, Galatians 3 even told you promise says. How about that? See, you got to realize this. God made different covenants to different people. And it's only to them, only one, nobody else. That's why Paul said it's not seeds many, only one seed. Why? Concerning this promise, this promise, this promise. A Jew can't just say, oh, I'm a physical Jew, so that includes me. No, you can't do that. It's only one seed right here, Christ. You got to get in Jesus Christ. And then these silly little anti-dispensationalists, they want to jump right over here. Oh, it's me, it's me. No, it's only one seed right here, and it's a physical seed. It's Jews. So look at Genesis 12. That's his second one, see? Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Also, let me ask you this question. If you think that God only made one promise in the entire Bible, or only one promise to Abraham in the entire Bible, my question to you is this. Why did God repeat this promise if it's one and the same at 12, 17, and 22? He already made the promise. Why does he have to do it again? See that? Because there's something else that's different that's going on. There are different promises. And Galatians 3.16 already proved to you its promise says, plural. Okay, so let's look at Genesis chapter 12. Look at verse 2. Now, do you think this is honestly a saved Christian? Come on, this is not a saved Christian. Spiritual seed. This is physical. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Notice that at verse 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's why we strongly believe that in this physical nation, that if you bless this physical nation, the Jews, then what happens? The families and different nations will be blessed because of that. If you curse them, then God's going to curse you. And if you look at history, look at all the nations that turned against the nation of Israel and what did God do with them. Good advice. Get hands off. Hands off. Let's also look at verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I what? Give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So notice that God promised that land to Abraham. So that's why the Jews, they this is all physical. You saw that right there? It's all physical. You'll notice that Genesis chapter 12, God said, I will make of thee a great nation. Singular. Why would he do that? And then later on, he would say, nations come out of thee. That doesn't make sense. No, it makes perfect sense because God has a physical dealing and a spiritual dealing. Yeah. It's rightly dividing. Yeah. And it's only one, it's only one in the physical side and only one in the spiritual side. We're not gonna include anybody else in here and we're not gonna include anybody else in yeah. here. That's why you have to believe in rightly dividing as a dispensationalist. So you gotta realize this. It does make sense that there is a seed and in this seed, God made a specific promise no other seed is included concerning which promise? The spiritual promise. The spiritual promise from Christ that they would have such, uh, that they would have what? Imputed righteousness, faith for salvation. They didn't have to do all these works of the law. That's what Paul was trying to point out right there. And remember in my previous teachings, that will be very effective when you witness to a Jew. When you point out to them that when God made the covenant with Abraham, what happened? God, when he made that covenant, he told them to believe, and then when Abraham believed, the Bible says in the Old Testament, God counted to him for righteousness. So that will be very effective when witnessing to a Jew, that there is such a thing called faith for salvation, not by works. And you can use that part to argue for your point. Now, I'm not going to get into more detail. I already explained that in my previous teaching. If you haven't watched that, uh, watch the video. It's called... Um, I forgot what I titled it, Debunking Jews and Anti-Jews in One Blow, something like that. So, Debunking Jews and Anti-Jews in One Blow. So if you watch that video, it gives you a balance, it shows you both sides of the problem with Judaism 
and anti-dispensationalists concerning Abraham's salvation. So I'm not going to really get into that. I already covered that. Okay, let's return to our main text. See, do you believe in rightly dividing? You see why that thing is so important, dispensationalism? If you don't believe in rightly dividing, if you don't believe in dispensationalism, this is not going to make sense. Right. But you notice all these, every word, if you take every word as it is, it makes perfect sense when you believe in dividing it. Yeah. When you divide it, then it makes perfect sense. 